Um, we're not going to miss anything. And now we are in chapter uh, 6. We are not intentionally skipping chapter 5. Chapter 5 is going to be handled by the big dog, Steve Van Denen, next week. Um, they don't pay me enough to do chapter 5. But chapter 6... <laughs> yeah, wait till next week. You think I'm in a bad spot next week? No, but chapter 6 is uh, all about um, really fleeing sexual immorality. Um, one of my favorite childhood games growing up was that game Operation. You know that game Operation where you have the little bones all throughout the little electronic body and you have to reach down and not touch the sides and get the little bone? That's, I feel like that. I, I feel like I'm just getting ready to try to get these little bones and I'm going to zap somebody. Um, so really, you know, it's very rarely that I'll say, just pray for me the whole time that I'm preaching. Um, but really, this topic is obviously charged on all sides of the bone, so to speak. And um, I'm just really hoping that, uh, I, I know that God's going to do something awesome, um, but I'm definitely feeling like a nine-year-old hanging over that little operation game, just trying to get the, get the pieces out. But the Lord um, is good. He has a lot of grace for us. And uh, we're going to look at the topic today is Jesus, our faithful and jealous husband, the reason for sexual purity. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define sexual immorality because we have to. We just have to in our culture. We have to define what that is. I'm going to look at Adam and Eve and talk about the need for a covenant in, uh, with, with sex. And then I'm going to look at Jesus, our faithful and jealous husband. And before I do any of that, I'm going to pray. So if you guys want to pray with me, um, we're going to get into something good. Well, Heavenly Father, you've, you've asked this church and you've asked the leadership to preach all the word. And Lord, we need it. So Lord, I'm asking you, I'm coming before you, Lord, not only for myself, but for everybody in the room, and I'm just asking, Lord, for your grace. Your grace, Lord, that, that brings us truth in a way that we can grab a hold of it without it burying us, and a grace that we can grab a hold of that changes us. Because, Lord, we know that your grace is not there to pass over sin. Your grace is there to give us power to overcome sin. And, Lord, we want all of what you have for us, Lord. We want freedom. We want grace. We want purity before you, Lord. That's our desire. So, Father, we just come to you and we just echo back to you what you want for us. You want a holy bride set apart for your son, Jesus. And we want that as well. Lord, again, I just pray... For my words, I pray that when they, when, when, they, when they flow from me, Lord, that you would be in them in a way that brings truth, brings conviction, but brings power to change, power to move towards your holiness. That's what we need, Lord. I can't do that. No one can do that but your spirit. So, Lord, we just receive it. Lord, we believe that you're going to do an awesome work here. And we trust you with it. We trust you with it, Lord. All the counsel of God, we trust you. In your son's name, amen. We're in the book of Corinthians. Um, I can tell you that I, I cannot exaggerate the problem that the pagan Roman system had with sexual immorality. To illustrate, I'll try, but I'll, I'll try to illustrate. Imagine that in downtown Aurora or downtown Naperville or whatever downtown you live in, imagine there is multiple city blocks that are sectioned off and are dedicated to temple sex, prostitution, and worship of sex. I want you to imagine that you are downtown, Naperville, Aurora, Wheaton, wherever you are, and there are whole city blocks that are sectioned off, dedicated to temple prostitution and every kind of sexual sin that you can probably put in your brain. That was the situation in all the Roman Empire, particularly in the bigger cities, of which Corinth was a bigger city, could you imagine sending your child out for milk or bread and they would have to pass by multiple blocks dedicated to sexual immorality? I know that we feel like in our culture that we've lost some ground on sexual immorality. Definitely from the foundations of our culture and from our foundations of our country, we have lost ground. But I will tell you that it's nothing compared to what it was in Corinth and in pagan Rome. 
And so when Paul comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is so utterly foreign to the culture, he is telling the Corinthians what Jesus wants from them, what Jesus expects from them, all for their good. And one of the things that he says, and we find it in chapter 6 of Corinthians, he says he wants us to flee sexual immorality. Which is a big statement in that culture because that culture was so given to it, it was so much a part of who they were, that it was a big deal to say, come out from that. And so we read in 1 Corinthians 13, B through 20. This is Paul, by the way, answering questions from from Corinth about what it means to be a Christian in a pagan world. And here's what he says. He says, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and he will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take a member of Christ and make them a member of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord himself becomes one in spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And no matter how demanding we think that is on us today, times it by a million on Corinth in that day. But yet God says, flee sexual immorality. I feel the need, before we jump into the deeper things, to simply define sexual immorality. I provide a definition that's from the Bible, and the definition of sexual immorality is this. Any sexual act or intention of the heart that occurs outside of marriage. Marriage being defined as a covenant relationship between one man and one woman. So sexual immorality is any sexual act or intention of the heart that is outside of the confines of a covenant marriage between one man and one woman. We cool? Feel that? (laughs) Okay. I should stand back here a little bit. Okay. That was good effect, though. I feel like we have to define this because, in some sense, this has been lost in the American church Um, It is not confused in the Bible. The Bible is very clear on what sexual immorality is. The first century Christian church was very, very direct on what sexual immorality was. And it was very clear in the American Christian church up until about five days ago. But somehow, some way, recent years, recent months, this idea of sexual immorality got lost on the church and so we have to reclaim it again. I would offer to you that there is, if there is a misunderstanding in our mind about what sexual immorality is, I will promise you that it is not put there by God, not put there by the Bible, not put there by good doctrine. Part of living out the Christian life is that we have to take all the voices that are in our head and assign them to, who, to where they came from. Amen? We have to assign the ideas, the constructs of culture And we have to know where those voices come from. I can promise you that anything that is outside the confines of a covenant between one man and one woman is called sexual immorality in the Bible. And Hebrews 13.4 is just one example. Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral, immoral and the adulterous. And what he's saying there, and this is all throughout Scripture, is there's covenantal love between a man and a woman and everything else. This is sanctioned sexual activity. Everything else is not. Earlier on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says very clearly, because the Corinthians needed it, and we need it, he said, do not be deceived, there is a deception. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, and he calls out women who practice such in Romans 1, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers 
will inherit the kingdom. I've heard it said that why are you picking on homosexuality? Why are you picking on sexual immorality? Why are you picking on premarital sex? There's a lot of sins that are listed here. Are those sins greater or worse than the other sins listed here? And the answer is, to God, all sin is sin. But there is greater and lesser sin based upon the consequences that we suffer by engaging in it. But the issue today is not that we're picking on one sin or the other. The issue in the American church is that we're not calling certain sins what they are. Amen? And so we have to go back to the foundation. We have to say these are things that if practiced are not righteous, are not within the plan and design of God's awesome ideas for us, and we have to call it what it is. That's why the definition of sexual morality is any sexual act or intention of the heart that occurs outside of marriage, marriage being defined as a covenant relationship between one man and one woman. That is what sexual morality is. And there's grace for us this morning. No matter what's in our past, no matter what's here today, not only in our minds as we try to conceptualize what it is that God calls us to, but also in our past and what we have engaged in, I think that God is, I'm not going to say laughing, but he has a smile on his face that I'm actually speaking on this topic. I lived a life before I had the life. Amen? There's grace. I want you to know that I'm right there with you. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with us. We are one body. And I have the mic, and I'll give it to anybody who wants it right now. <laughs> there is grace for us. Even right now, as I, as I speak, I feel like there's freedom coming into the room. There's a power of the Holy Spirit coming into the room to redeem us, past, present, and giving us the strength to walk in purity in the future. Amen. A covenant. What is a covenant? Well, the covenant comes from Genesis, and I want to take a moment now, and I want to talk about what a covenant looks like and why that's necessary in a sexual relationship. And so we're going to go to Genesis uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 18 through 25. We're going to look at Adam and Eve, and we're going to look at this covenant real quick, okay? So here it is, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord creates the whole earth, the whole world, and then he says something interesting. He says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept took one of his ribs and closed that place up with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, Yes, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. That, that, that term hold fast is a covenant word. Hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Amen. So God says, it's not good that man should be alone. And so he and Adam, God and Adam, go on a treasure hunt. And in this moment, when God says to Adam, it's not good that you're alone, and they go to look, Adam becomes a looker. He becomes a seeker. He becomes a gazer at creation, looking for the thing that will fulfill all the animals come before him, and it says, but there was no helper fit for him. In this moment, I want to say, thank you, God, that none of the animals worked. <laughs> so then Eve is presented to Adam, and then Adam uttered a very, very ancient Hebrew word. He uttered a very, very special, unique Hebrew word. He said, bingo. <laughs> bingo is a very ancient word. And he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She kind of looks like me, but she doesn't. <laughs> and then it says, they held fast to each other 
Covenant terminology we'll cover in a minute. And they were naked and not ashamed. Adam is the beholder. Eve is the beheld. Amen? I don't care what culture you're from. I don't care how far back you go. You can go to the garden. You can go to 10,000 years from now. Let me tell you something. Men are made to look. Women are made to look at. Period. There's a story of a guy that I know who um, had a five-year-old son. And the five-year-old son somehow got a hold of his mom's Victoria's Secret catalog. I hear there's girls with underwear in those catalogs. And so he brings the catalog to school to show his friends. Kindergartner, boy. And so the kindergarten teacher calls the father and says, uh, Sir, your son brought a Victoria's Secret catalog to school. So, of course, the father was kind of happy, but at the same time a little bit upset. So the son came home, and the father said to the son, Your teacher called me and told me that you brought a magazine of girls in underwear and bras to school. Why'd you do it? And the son said, I like the pictures. <laughs> That's a good answer. Adam is seeking. Eve is found. He is meant to look. She is meant to be looked at. We are made to look, men. Women, you are made to look at. That's the way that God did it. That desire is not bad. That craving is not bad. It's what we do with it. It's how we handle it that makes all the difference in the world. Amen? Amen? I'm not going to get too church lady here. I'm not going to get too religious. Um, I will say, though, that I love going to Africa because in Africa the women are very modest and I don't have, to, I don't have anything going on uh, just barraging me day in and day out. Um, I think the, 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 final, the final blow was yoga pants in America. Uh, I hope you're not wearing yoga pants, especially the men. I hope you're not wearing yoga pants. We were doing so good. It was like the summer was over, the shorts were gone, the skirts were gone, then they got yoga pants, man. It's like, wait, we can't win. I, I do. <laughs> yeah, yoga pants. But I, I will say that, I will say that I think if women, maybe they, well, obviously they know, they know we're looking. But, but if women really, really, truly knew what was going on in a man's heart, I think they would be different. They would act different around us, amen. And I think that men would move to Africa. Because men are made to look, women are made to be looked at. That's the way it is. Everything in creation was brought before Adam. Nothing worked. Eve, bingo. That's how it goes. That's the baseline of our desire. Obviously, you can see there's a lot of manipulation, a lot of, um, a lot of brokenness that's happened as a result of that baseline desire. It is the oldest profession in the world. It is the mechanism that causes many things to go around the world. And for that reason, lots of brokenness, lots of manipulation, lots of pain. For that reason, we need a covenant. And we see that in the story as well. Adam says, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. Say, hold fast. To his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And then it says, and the man and his wife are both naked and not ashamed. That word hold fast is a word that we see in covenant language all throughout the Bible. We see it in Deuteronomy at least four times that I could find. Deuteronomy 13.4 says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. And we can get into a lot of depth there on what a covenant is, but essentially it means this. It means that we covenant with someone even unto death. We covenant with someone, no matter what it costs us. And it's that unction of the heart, it's that heart that allows us to hold the most powerful force on the planet, sex. Notice the pattern, they held fast, then they were naked and not ashamed. That's the order. What that means is basically... If you are willing to die for me and you make a vow before God and man, then I will give myself to you. Amen? The vulnerability of laying oneself bare before another to be taken is so, so powerful that it takes a covenant unto death to hold it. The power found in sex, the fiery, raw desire that it is, needs to be protected by a covenant unto death. 
But we must understand that it's, we must say this in our, to ourselves. If you want my body, I get your whole life. Amen? Any sexual activity outside of a held fast covenant between a man and a woman leads to brokenness, leads to destruction, leads to pain, and it leads to a fragmentation of our being. A fragmentation of our being. And that was the problem in Corinth. You see, there was a pagan idea, and we see it in our culture today, there was a pagan idea that we're categorical. We have a body, we have a soul, we have a mind. They're separate. I deal with them separately. We see that in everything. We see we have a church life, we have a work life, we have a home life, we have an entertainment life. There's a fragmentation, and that's the beginning of the end when it comes to being whole and holy before the Lord. There's a fragmentation in our believing. There was a belief... And you see Paul answer this in chapter 6. There was a belief that your body was not important to God. Your body was not important to your spirit. We are spiritual. Therefore, our body doesn't matter. And it was this fragmented view that was being promoted in the church in Corinth. And it's a fragmented view that's being pressed upon you and me every day in our culture. I want to share with you some lyrics from a song. I'm kind of laughing because it's Lady Gaga. She's really talented, isn't she? She's an amazing singer. Um, Her songs are catchy. Um, I'm not saying I listen to her. I'm not saying I don't. I'm just saying that there's some lyrics here. No, I don't like Lady Gaga. but, But I did listen to a song one time that really, really grabbed at this concept of being fragmented. Here's the here's the song. Maybe you heard it. You can't have my heart and you won't use my mind, but do what you want with my body. I'm not going to sing it. (laughs) Do what you want with my body. You can't stop my voice. That's her will, right? You can't stop my voice because you don't own my life, but you can do what you want with my body. This is the fragmentation of our being that is um, threatened, that is happening in us. God wants all of us. It says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants all of our spirit. He wants all of our soul. He wants all of our body. He wants all of it. He loves all of it. He wants it all. That's what Jesus wants. Amen? He doesn't sing Lady Gaga. He doesn't do that. Jesus wants it all. Jesus gave it all before he asked for any of it. Amen? He wants it all. He can ask for it all because he gave it all. Spirit, soul, and body, he wants it all. And I want to assure you that this, this, this message, the center of it is not marriage, okay? I'm not trying to make a marriage statement, but marriage is the covenantal way that we engage in sex. What I want to tell you is that Jesus is our husband. Jesus is the one who paid for us. Jesus is the one who paid for his bride. And Jesus wants all of us, not part of us, not a fragmented sacrifice. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 6, we just read it a little while ago, it says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Jesus gave it all before he asked for anything. The Bible says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know that we have to know how Christ loved us before we can hold that up to how we're being loved by our husband, ladies. Then husbands, we have to know how Christ loved us so that we can love that way, men, right? I think so often in the church, marriage is touted as the answer to everything. Every longing, every desire, every yearning is fulfilled in marriage. I think anybody who's married for five minutes knows that ain't true. I think the ladies are saying to themselves about day three into the honeymoon, I shaved my legs for this. No, I'm just kidding. I am saying, though, that here's, here's an issue. We have, not only do we have parenting boot camp, we have a pre-marriage counseling because, you know what, people go into that thing with expectations, and a lot of times those expectations are supposed to be met in Jesus, and they're not met in the spouse, and there's huge problems. Russ and Sharon, can I get an amen? amen. All right. We have to be loved completely by Jesus before we can give ourselves to anyone completely in love. Amen. All right. 
We have to know the love of Jesus. We have to know what he did, how he did it, what he says, before we can give any of that to anybody else. And here's the thing. This is not, we're not Jerry Maguire in Christianity, okay? No one completes you but Christ. Remember that scene? You complete me. No, you don't. No. You take half my food, okay? We fall short a little bit when we talk about sexual purity because we think it's all about marriage. It is about marriage. That's the lowercase t truth. But the capital T truth, it's all about Jesus, how he loves us. He's a jealous husband. It says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, and Dana spoke on this last week at our Easter service. Who was at our Easter service? Probably the best service we ever had. It was awesome. Then you show up to this. Anyway, um, <laughs> It says in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy? Dana covered it last time. What was the joy? You. Remember Adam in the garden? Adam was searching for a helpmate, a partner. But do you know that Eve was in Adam the whole time? She was in him the whole time. And Jesus, he had something in him too. He had a vision that compelled him and it put him to the cross and that vision was you and me. We were in Christ. The Bible says that we were in Christ from before the foundations. We were hidden in Christ like Eve was in Adam. We are the husband of Jesus and we were hidden in him. Remember Adam? He was put to sleep and Eve was taken from the rib. Jesus was put to sleep. He died. He died. And do you remember when they took the spear to see if he was dead? They hit him where? In the rib. And from that place flowed water and flowed blood. Water for our cleansing and blood for our ransom. There's a very deep thing being said in Genesis. It's being reiterated in Jesus and it's consummated in Revelation. That we were in Christ from before the foundation of the world because we were in him and he wanted to bring us forth. He went and died. He bled and he gave water for our cleansing and for our purchase. And then what does he get? He gets his bride. Sexual purity is about so much more than having a great marriage. It's about so much more than that. It's about so much more than keeping yourself from marriage. That's really good. That's really necessary. There's a lot of joy in that. But sexual purity, inside the marriage or even outside the marriage, sexual purity is all about knowing that Jesus is a faithful, giving, and jealous, in a good way, husband over us. And he wants everything. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and he cleansed us from his rib. He cleansed us, he sanctified us by his blood, and now he wants to reunite with his bride. That's the capital T truth behind sexual purity. Amen? And do you remember when Eve was finally brought to Adam and Adam said, wow. We have that same pattern in Revelation. The book of Revelation, it says this. Then I heard what seemed like to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of, For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted to her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. What's happening is that Jesus is preparing himself for a day where he is reunited with his bride forever and eternity. We are called to purity. We are called to keep ourselves for him because he is faithful. He gave everything first. He would never ask for anything. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if anyone wants to take anything from you without giving everything to you, that's not love. Jesus can ask us for all right now because he gave everything already. Amen?
That's where our purity, that's where we find our purity. That's where we find the strength to walk out in grace, the purity that we're called to. Jesus is our faithful husband. He had a longing in his heart for a bride. He was put to sleep, and then out of his rib came cleansing, and came a ransom of blood. And he is right now making his bride, you and me, the whole church collective, all billion of us or whatever there is right now, he's making all of us perfect, spotless, beautiful for presentation to him when it's all said and done. Amen? But wait, there's more. Because we know that we're not with him yet fully, right? We are, we see through the Spirit, we see in faith, we see that he has called us, sanctified us, purified us to be with him in perfect union one day, to hold fast to him forever. But Paul says something else in 1 Corinthians 6. It's something very important. It's another reason why we are called to purity, why we are called to holiness. Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. There's a lot we could say about the Holy Spirit, but in the context of covenant, in the context of being the bride of Christ. By the way, one of my questions on the note that I put is I wanted to ask the the gentlemen how they feel about being the bride of Christ. And if you have a good answer, send it to me because I don't know how I feel about it. (laughs) That's really a selfish question. I want the answer. Anyway. But he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You know what? He liked it and he put a ring on it, and that ring is the Holy Spirit. That's Beyonce and Lady Gaga in one message. Okay. He did, though. If you read about the Holy Spirit, many things to be said. He gives gifts. He sanctifies. There's a lot of things. He's God fully. He does everything. But one of the things, particularly, that is talked about with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is very specifically an engagement gift from our betrothed. It says in the book of Ephesians, it says, In him you and Jesus also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Do you know that right now the church is wearing this beautiful engagement ring called the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he is a gift to us to hold us, to keep us, to sanctify us. He put the ring on our finger. He sealed us, so to speak, so that we would have the strength and the power to walk in purity, to remain undefiled from the world until we reunite with Jesus again. Amen? That's why Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body matters. Your body matters because your body is what keeps your spirit and your soul together. Your body is what houses everything. Your body is the first place of wholeness for you. And Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit into us as a guarantee of our inheritance. Our inheritance being a faithful and jealous husband in heaven and everything else that goes with it. And we are held by the Holy Spirit. We are given the Holy Spirit and sanctified by the Holy Spirit until we see him face to face, until that bride is rolled out from heaven and Jesus looks upon her in the fullness. Until that time, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is housed in the temple of God, which is our body. And so we see that the body does matter because the body houses the Holy Spirit. I feel like, man, if I could get in a time machine and go back to about 1987, that's about when it all started happening for me, 12, 13 years old. If I could go back in a time machine and tell myself one thing, I would tell them this, that there is, there is great pain and great loss in not walking in sexual purity and that you are purchased with a price, and that price is the blood of the Son of God, and to prove it, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, sanctified by the Spirit, and kept by Him. 
and if you give yourself to anyone, first give yourself fully to them and make sure they give themselves fully to you and give yourself to each other and hold fast to each other in a covenant unto death because that can hold, that can hold the power of sexuality. But even more than that, that's going to hold you until the day of your full redemption where you see Jesus. And I feel like even right now, the Holy Spirit is saying two things. He's saying, yep, that's true, and yes, I love you, and yes, I have grace for you, and you can start over whenever you want. Just receive the cleansing and the forgiveness and the power that's afforded to us through faith. I feel like this is the time where I have to get the bone out of the (laughs) the operation set. But I just want you to know that this is not about guilt. This is not about shame. Even right now, if things are rising up in you from things that have happened to you or things that you have done, just know that God has covered. Jesus has paid for all of it already. And we, through faith, we apply that. We apply that to our hearts. And we seal ourselves by the Spirit and we walk in it with strength and power and grace. I'm going to invite the band back up and I got one more closing thought. There's a really cool book um, that when I first became a Christian, I was like, whoa, this is in the Bible? And it's a book called Song of Solomon. Anybody ever read Song of Solomon? It's like scandalous, man. Yeah, and then, then you get into the notes. Don't go to the notes, okay? If you have the Bible, don't go to the ESV study notes because they'll tell you what that stuff means. Anyway, what I, love about, what I love about our religion, what I love about Christianity, what I love about the Judeo-Christian worldview is that we're not afraid to talk about sex, are we? Was it PG-13 today, I hope? Okay, that's what I promised. So we are not afraid to talk about sex. We are not afraid to talk about the, the power and the beauty of sex. We're not afraid to talk about what it means and what God has for us in that. And Song of Solomon definitely doesn't hold any punches when they talk about sex, okay? But many have said, and I totally agree, and it's even been revealed to me kind of directly that God said, yes, that's true to me, is that this book is a metaphor between Christ and the church. This book, Song of Solomon, is a love affair between Christ and the church, if you can can receive that. And there's a great um, scripture from that book that closes out Song of Solomon And it's uh, verse 8. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. I love this. It says, Set me as a seal upon your heart and as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. There's the covenant. Love is as strong as death. Jealousy as fierce as the grave. It flashes Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. That's passion. Jesus has passion for us. And many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. That's the love that Jesus has for his bride, the church. He has a passionate love for us. He is our husband. He has a love affair with the church, and he wants all of it. He wants us to the death, because he gave himself to the death. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that awesome? It's the only thing that's going to give us the ability to rise up in sexual purity and walk it out is to know that God himself covenanted with us unto death. So let's rise. We're going to worship. And let's just receive that. Lord, I thank you that you love us unto death. Lord, that you gave yourself. Lord, that you went first. Lord, that you don't demand anything from us that you wouldn't do first. And Lord, you gave us, you gave us your body. You, your body was broken for us, Lord, for your bride. You, you, you bled. Lord, you even washed us clean. And Jesus, I pray right now, the Holy Spirit would come and in the name of Jesus, break off any guilt or any shame from the past that is in this room. Lord, any, any guilt or condemnation, Lord, as we come to you in true repentance and true understanding of what you call us to, Lord, for your glory and for our joy, Lord, I, pr- I break off anything that is not of you any sexual immorality that is not of you, Lord, in this room. Lord, I break off all things that are not in your plan for us, Lord. Lord, I pray too that we can be held by a love that is just so incomprehensible. It's as jealous as the grave, Lord, that you would just show us, Lord, that love. Lord, we have to know your love to love like you love. 
So Lord, we just pray for a release of that love and that power. And Lord, we come to you, Lord. We come to you, Lord, knowing that we are not perfect. Lord, I thank you that I can even stand here and talk about this stuff. Lord, we come to you not perfect, but being perfected. And Lord, now that we know what this is about, Lord, we give you our full hearts. I break off any unforgiveness that anyone's struggling with, Lord, who's been abused. I break off any soul ties that could have happened there. I break off anything, Lord, that is not of you, Lord. I break off abuse, sexual abuse in Jesus' name, and we release your supernatural forgiveness there. Lord, I break off any, um, anything that is not centered on you in the marriage, Lord. I just break off anything that is not of you in the marriage, Lord. If there's any abuse there, any misunderstanding, any manipulation there, we release your grace to truly love as you love us. And Lord, I pray for all those who desire a husband or desire a wife. Lord, I pray that they would have the faith to ask. And Lord, I also pray too that you would, that you would give them that gift. Not because they are lacking, but because it is good. And Father, I just release a supernatural faith in that place too. And Lord, that we are kept and hold we are held by your purity and by your love for us until that day when we see you again. Lord, I release that supernatural grace. We're believing big things this morning, God. We go against the culture. We don't listen to the whispers of the enemy. We release a supernatural power to walk in what you've called us to walk in. By your grace, Jesus, amen.